Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Brash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Today's broadcast is brought to you by Harry's Razors. It's shaving without the crazy expensive prices, the long checkout lines, the cheap blades that tear up your skin. Just a better shaving experience delivered right to your door. And $5 off your first purchase if you want to try them out. Just log on to harrys.com. That's H-A-R-R-Y-S dot com. And type in our coupon code, THINKINGATHEIST. Just before I got on the radio here tonight, I've been reading and watching the headlines about that terrible earthquake in Nepal. Just a horrible, horrible tragedy. I guess the death toll is north of 4,000, and that number continues to climb. A terrible, terrible week. It's always interesting to watch the God Squad in these moments. The televangelist, the doomsdayers, you know, the pastors and preachers and pundits as they all come forward and they sort of grab this tragedy for their own purposes. Uh, it's the end of the world. We talked about that in my recent presentation, which I posted on YouTube called Get Them While They're Young. And I addressed it in my upcoming book called Sacred Cows in a chapter that's titled This is the End, Beautiful Friend. It's the end of days, right? The apocalypse is upon us. This is God's judgment, that kind of deal. And then you've got guys like mega pastor Creflo Dollar, who went on social media and said, Our hearts go out to the families and friends of those affected by the devastating earthquake in Nepal. And he has pray for Nepal as his hashtag. Now, this is the same guy who last month publicly asked for donations from his flock so that he might buy a personal jet to the tune of 65 million dollars. Now, I guess this jet would replace his current personal jet. Huge blowback, huge fallout, right? He becomes even more of a laughingstock than he already is. And I guess just a few days ago came forward and said the reason that there was such negative publicity and a negative response was, of course, Satan. That's right. It's the devil keeping him from doing his fine work for Jesus. (sighs) So anyway, and I'm thinking to myself, $65 million would go a long way toward helping the needy in Nepal instead of hauling your ass from coast to coast and around the world so that you can spread lies. And I don't mean to rub salt in the wound of a horrible tragedy. I'm not trying to borrow the tragedy for my own ends, but I would like to ask a question, which I think is a legitimate one. As everybody is hashtagging pray for Nepal, why are we praying for God's blessings on a region that just imploded upon itself on God's watch? Right? Why is nobody holding God accountable for doing nothing while innocent people are being crushed by buildings? Anyway, that's a whole other show, but it strikes me every time someone says, pray for the afflicted, I'm like, where was the guy who could have stopped all the affliction? He sees everything coming. He's omniscient. He's all powerful. He could stop it. What has he been doing? Is he making rainbows and finding car keys and appearing on toast? What's he doing? Because there were at least 4,000 people whose precious lives are gone because he was busy doing something else or he didn't give a shit. Those are the kinds of questions that I want to bring to these conversations. Anyway, that's a whole other broadcast. On tonight's broadcast, I'm going to play for you, my friends, an actual audio recording of hell. It's a classic clip that's been floating around for several years now, and it's still out there. And there are many people, believe it or not, who are actually convinced that what I'm going to play you tonight is audio of hell. And I'll tell you the story and play you the audio. Plus, we're going to talk about those in our inner and outer circles who are just terrified. They're frightened. They're horrified that you and I are sliding the slippery slope toward eternal 
torment. What are they saying? What are they doing? And what should our response be? That's coming up here tonight on the broadcast. Real fast, on Sunday, I'm going to be in Fullerton, California. It's the Free Thought Alliance Conference. Nathan Phelps going to be there. Russell Glasser of the Atheist Experience. Teresa McBain. Ryan Bell, the Year Without God pastor. He's going to be there, probably telling a story. It's going to be awesome. If you want to go, it's in Fullerton, California. at uh, freethoughtalliance.org slash FTA. And the rest of them on the calendar, there's so many, there's no way I can really get to all of them here. But real fast, here's a snapshot. San Francisco, May 23rd. Seattle, June 4th. Going to Vancouver the weekend of June 5th. Later in June is the Oklahoma Free Thought Convention in Tulsa. Then back to California. We're doing Sacramento, San Jose, San Luis Abismo, Riverside, San Diego. We got St. Louis, Missouri coming up in July. A Texas run in August. A ton of tour stop dates where I come out and bring a live presentation and we just hang out with our local free thinkers and skeptics and just and we just sit around being infidels together. It's always a great time. You can go to the thinkingatheist.com slash events for all the details on the tour and all the links and addresses and anything else you might need to know. Next week's broadcast is going to be a fun one. It's called the weirdest websites in the world. Some of them will be religious websites, obviously, but we're not limiting ourselves to that. It's going to be kind of a wild ride as we pinball around the web and talk about some of the most bizarre, crazy stuff that's out there. And I'll pull up the sites, describe them for you, and give you the link in case you want to go and check them out for yourself. It's going to be kind of a lighthearted, fun show, especially after doing the Hell broadcast this week. It'll be nice to sort of lighten things up next Tuesday night. And if you have a submission for a weirdest website in the world, you can email that to podcast at thethinkingatheist.com. Before we travel into the pit of Hades tonight, a real quick thank you out to our sponsor. It's Harry's Dot com, the brainchild of a couple of guys who thought they could do a better shaving experience and a better value than so many of these big heritage brands that you and I see on the shelves. And so what they did was they bought a blade factory in Germany with about 100 years in the business of manufacturing high quality razor blades. And Harry's is making a huge splash with products like the Truman set, the Winston set, the Jimmy Chin set. These are full shaving kits delivered with free shipping right to your mailbox. The starter kit's just 15 bucks. That's the razor, three blades, and your choice of hairy shave cream or foaming shave gel. I personally kind of dig the gel. That's just me. Shaving plans you can customize based on how often you shave and a presentation that makes Harry's a great gift option for guys. Birthdays, holidays, Father's Day. You get it, right? I I like Harry's. I like their style, the weight and feel of the razors. I like the whole process, inexpensive and streamlined. And I like the free delivery. Shave smarter with Harry's. You get $5 off your first purchase. Always free shipping at harrys.com. And don't forget your promo code, Thinking Atheist. That's H A R R Y S dot com. Daryl sent this message in for the show tonight. He said, I saw the subject of the podcast this week and knew there was something I wanted to take a minute to share. This was a note I got from my father when I came out to him and my mother this past Christmas. Quote, if you want to believe there is no God, then there is no mercy, grace, hope, healing, redemption, eternal love to save a lost world. There is no Christmas Because you deny the prophecy of Isaiah that Jesus is the Son of God and the soon coming King. Stay in darkness and know that the God who gives you provision is not going to be able to help you when you're helpless. Your free will. Your free will. That's a freestanding sentence. The unpardonable sin is to reject the Holy Spirit and Christ's sacrifice for you. That's from a dad who cares and loves you through it all. Daryl said, I just thought this was something I'd share with the community and appreciate all that is the thinking atheist community and how much it's helped in my transition out of a fundamental charismatic Pentecostal faith and belief. Daryl, thanks for sharing the message. It's a tragic message. I want to know this. Your father says, stay in darkness and know that the God who gives you provision is not going to be able to help you when you're helpless. If he can't help you when you're helpless, why is he a God? 
I've never understood this paradox. My God can do anything. He can do anything. But he won't be able to stop you from going to hell. What? He can't help you when you're helpless? He's God. This makes no sense to me. Tina said, I am the only child of devout Lutheran parents, and I came out of the atheist closet when I was 14. The initial shock was intense. There was shouting and there were tears. However, I'm happy to say that my relationship with my mom and dad has eased over the past four years. Still, I can't shake the feeling of tension between us, my mother especially. I really wish this was something we could just set to the side and ignore, but we can't. From their perspective, I'm going to literally burn for all eternity. It doesn't matter what arguments I use to show them that this makes no sense and that they have nothing to worry about. This is how religion works. It disregards logic and reason and feeds on our deepest fears. I swear if my mom brings up Pascal's wager one more time, I don't know how I will maintain my sanity. I would like to ask for your help. How can I reach someone who refuses to listen? Well, Tina, I don't have a lot of great wisdom for you. I've got a little bit of experience, but I don't have the magic bullet. I don't have the answer. If someone is more interested in sending than receiving, Right? They're going to talk, 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 but they will not listen. There's not a whole lot you can do. In my experience, I don't think there's much you can do at all. If someone's not listening, if they don't care, you can throw all the reason at them, all the data, all the information. You know, you can throw the history of hell and Dante and all that stuff at them. You can, you can get into the morality of hell. You can look at the incongruity of hell according to the scriptures and the different religions and their versions of hell. You can do all that and it won't make any difference because they are not listening. And if there was one piece of advice I might give you, it's don't waste your time. I mean... It's important to make the argument at least once, I think. You know, if someone's coming at you, I think it's important to state your position and to put the rebuttal out there and to say, no, I disagree and here's why. I think that's the responsible thing to do. But don't get sucked into that black hole where you're always, always having that back and forth with someone who's not listening because what's happening is your time's just being wasted. You're not being productive and you've got better things to do with your life. You want to have forward momentum. You want to move in a positive direction. You're not going to get there if you're dealing with somebody who's living in an echo chamber. State your case, do so clearly, do so with an even voice, and then, if there's no dialogue to be had, move on to something else. And hopefully one day, these people will decide they'd like to have a dialogue instead of a monologue, and perhaps you guys can break some ground then. Curtis said, I'm an agnostic atheist and a bit of a Marxist, as my family's entirely comprised of good old-fashioned military-bred Christian Republicans from Texas. I left for Seattle. I'm beyond the black sheep analogy. I recently had an argument with my father who called me anti-good for humanity, anti-freedom, and anti-truth. This led into a long phone call about God, hell, and where I belong. I was also accused of being toxic to my daughter, Azali, who was born in February of 2015. You can imagine how furious this made me. And the short version is, it did not end well. I was told I was condemned. My wife of nine years, who's a loose Christian, we wed long before my deconversion, is on her way to being condemned. And my daughter, in turn, will be condemned because of us if we do not let them teach her. My reason for writing this is partly my respect for your work and partly my need to vent to someone who shared the experience of family ties being broken due to religious and or ideological reasons. It seems odd that those who profess undying love are so quick to tear to shreds those who disagree with their beliefs. I've found through reflection that this is due to a loss of self-identity. It seems to me that those who truly embrace religion dissolve their self in favor of becoming the ideology itself. Insult Christianity, thus you've insulted the Christian as a person. My father is not simply someone who's my father, the individual, but is a Christian first and a human being second. 
and this I cannot possibly embrace, respect, or be silent in my objection of. It's truly a most horrifying concept. What was truly frightening was when we dug deep into the concept of the end of humanity. I believe our ultimate goal is not some utopian society, but instead escaping extinction even potentially beyond our own universe. His belief was a rather simple one. The extinction of humanity is something to be excited about and is preordained. Jesus will return, death will ensue, and finally all shall be dead and separated into their groups of condemned and not. Thus for him and those who believe like him, human extinction is not only inevitable, but to be rejoiced. And that is the most horrific thing I have ever heard from anyone in my lifetime. And it came from my father. Curtis, thank you very much for sending the message. I wanted to take a few minutes tonight and uh, chat with a buddy of mine. Neil Carter does some great writing at the Godless in Dixie blog. I was reading some of his recent Facebook posts, and they reflect much of what we're hearing tonight. He's a somewhat recent apostate, and um, he's going through a lot of this kind of thing. Difficulties with parents, difficulties in regard to children, the threats of hell, the pity, the condescension, the alienation, and how do we deal with this kind of treatment? I thought his perspective would be a valuable addition to the broadcast tonight. Neil Carter, thank you so much for taking a few minutes, man. Great to have you. Thank you. Great work on CBS, by the way. Uh, national television telling sort of the story of a few atheists in the quote-unquote atheist movement, and they did a pretty even-handed take on it which i thought was refreshing yes they did uh, nice work i thought you did great thank you uh well everybody did a great job pitching in and the guys who did the interviews were really really sensitive to all of the issues that we brought to the table i was impressed with how they did how did they end up in your territory did they did they send you a, an email out of the blue or did they find you through your blog or what happened <laughs> Well, the reason they contacted me is because I was already connected with the Openly Secular campaign. Uh, early on, when it was just getting started, I was in contact with the people who were doing it, and I was one of the ones that sent in a video from the beginning to um, introduce myself as Openly Secular. So since they were the ones talking to CBS in the first place, they began putting out feelers to see if anybody had stories that they could tell that would explain what it's like for people that have a hard time coming out or that have negative consequences for coming out. So they were looking for stories, and I, I sort of told my story to them, and before I knew it, CBS was contacting me to see if I'd be willing to be interviewed for their piece. Neil, your story is really the reason we're talking today. This show is called My Family Thinks I'm Going to Hell. This is a sensitive mm -hmm. nerve with you, yeah? It is. Uh, well, I'm, I'm suspicious that a majority of the negative treatment that I've received from well-meaning people has been rooted in a fear that I'm going to hell and that anybody who listens to me is going to hell as well. And then, of course, I know explicitly that hell has been talked about around my children because my children have now told me that they're afraid I'm going to hell. So yes, this is a personal, personal issue for me. Don't let me trod on any personal territory you're not comfortable speaking about here, but if I may, how old are your children? No, I don't mind telling you. Mine uh, have four daughters. They are 15, getting ready to be 16, 14, 11, and 7. And you emerged from the faith, quote unquote, the faith in your 30s. Is that right? That's right. I was probably about 35 or 36. And so your kids were how old when this was happening? Did they sort of witness this emergence, this sort of change in your perception in regard to religion? No, they didn't because I kept it from them, honestly. It was, uh, it was something that was very private for me. And I remained involved in church for a number of years after it, like many people in my position do. I continued to go through the motions, but it just wasn't sincere anymore. And I eventually got to the point where I couldn't do that anymore. So my children saw that I was not going to church anymore. Um, and then eventually my marriage ended and they had a lot of questions, I'm sure, but they didn't really ask because I guess it made them uncomfortable. But they're beginning to see some of the story now because now I've come out a little bit more publicly. And it's only been in the last three or four months that I've told them point blank that I'm, I'm not a Christian anymore and that I'm an atheist. Like I said, they knew I wasn't going to church, but they hadn't made that step all the way into the A word. 
obviously this interview is about your story, not mine, but it's when you say that they didn't ask any questions, it just sort of strikes me in my own circle as well. It was a marked lack of curiosity. I have all mm. these people who know me, who know I'm a pretty thoughtful guy. I do a huge course correction or course change, at least in their minds. And out of dozens upon dozens of people in the family tree, I mean, most of my family even lives around here. They have these huge gatherings and family reunions and whatnot. Only one person out of any of those people came to me with any real questions and wanted to have some discussion to understand. Everybody else went into full rescue mode. Was that the case for you as well? Well, yeah, that's the first response. The first response is, well, this must just be a phase and something bad must have happened to you. And so whatever it is, I'm going to come to your side and counsel you through it so that you'll come back to the faith. So, yeah, everybody clicks into evangelism mode right away. But the ones who are the most uncomfortable with what's going on or maybe who have the most questions themselves, they're actually the least likely to contact me because I think maybe they sense that it would be a threat to them. You know, if, if you're struggling with your own faith, I think in some ways the last thing you want to do is talk to somebody who's already left it because then you're afraid they're going to sway you and who knows what's going to happen then. In a way, I can understand that. My deconversion was a solitary process because I didn't want anybody unduly influencing me one way or the other. So while I tried to talk to a few people, there really weren't many books that were helpful to me at the time. And anybody that I talked to that was clearly on one side or the other of this divide, I felt like would have would have nudged me one way or the other. And I didn't want that kind of influence. I wanted to process it all myself. So maybe that's what some of them are going through. That's an interesting perspective. Maybe the people who are keeping the greatest distance are the ones who are secretly harboring the deepest struggle, right? Holy shit, what happens if Neil Carter starts making sense? <laughs> yeah. The implications are huge, right? Right. right. And um, the thing is, those people would probably on the surface look the least like what you just described. Because they might be on the outside the most adamant of all of them. But, uh, you know, I've come to realize that some of the most uh, boisterous, demonstrative believers are the ones who struggle the most with their own doubts. And in a way, they're compensating. Do you catch any of the midlife crisis thing? Come on, he's in his 30s. He's heading toward 40. Yes, that was some of the first things that I got. Everybody tries to push it into a mold of what they understand. And while they didn't understand leaving the faith altogether, they totally understood midlife crisis. So, yes, they tried to push it into that. And they came across with really in a patronizing tone. You know, we all go through hard times. You'll make it through this. Just be patient. And then there's the implication there that if I come through and, and end up in a different place than where they ended up, then it's a fault of mine and I was being weak, which, of course, I don't appreciate. I've gone through the stuff you've gone through. I went through the valley in my own life, Neil, right. and mm -hmm. Jesus showed me the way and he led me by the hand and I just know that he's going to lead you out as well and one day you will come to know the truth. I actually wrote something about a st that statement was given to me last week in love, mm -hmm. quote unquote. And by the way, in the mm -hmm. church, you can do and say anything, even if it's horribly damaging, but you can do it in love. <laughs> and exactly. You get what yep. is that Dilbert comic that says you can be as uh, rude as you want to anybody you want as long as you preface it with with bless their respect, heart. right? Mm -hmm. Or bless their heart. <laughs> or bless their heart if you're from the South. Right. Well, and what I, what I get a lot is you just wait until something bad happens to you. Oh, yeah. Then you will see where your true faith is and, and what you can really trust. And there's a warped sense of ill wishing that's underneath that. And I think they would be horrified if they were to realize that that's going on. But in a sense, having somebody that was as devout as they are committed to the faith, then leaving it, it upsets their sense of justice, of justice and rightness, and, and they really feel like something bad needs to happen to me as a way of validating their continued faith. And so while they would never admit that they want to see things go badly for me, it so consistently has happened that they come to me and they tell me, one of these days, something bad's going to happen to you. And I, I stop them and I ask them, are you saying that you want that to happen? And they're like, no, 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 no. And then I ask, so are you saying God's going to make that happen to get my attention? Oh, no, 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 no. You know, if they're, unless they're really, really fundamentalist, they won't go that far. They won't put it in God's hands. They'll say, no, it's just that he might allow bad things happen to you so that you can learn your lesson, which I don't see the difference.
talking here with Neil Carter of the Godless in Dixie blog. Obviously, the show being about hell, your deconversion story and sort of the, the atmosphere around you colors that, which is why I wanted to take a few extra minutes. But people do play the hell card quite a bit. One day, Neil, you're going to know the truth and you're going to wish that you had gotten right with God when you had the chance. Talk about a threat. And right. you and I hear those types of things all the time. Yeah, well, um, and they, they don't realize it's a threat. They say, no, it's not a threat. We're just warning you. In love. I'm in doing love. this in love. But right. if you don't turn, you're going to burn. My father worships the very being that is going to torture me. I can't reconcile this in my head. Yeah, it's pretty messed up. How can my father worship the very creature who would torture me forever? Do you have members of your family that hold to a literal hell? Yeah, um, they fall into a spectrum. And it's funny how my apostasy has pushed some people from one part of the spectrum to a slightly different place. It makes people question what they believe. Because once they know somebody who's going there, now all of a sudden it changes the way they look at it. Um, I've got one family member who believes once saved, always saved. So the fact that I walked down an aisle and did a thing when I was 15, I'm good to go and I've got my fire insurance. So her main concerns for me are that my life will go bad you know, but then I'll die and then I'll go to heaven because Is she I like I an have old my... school Baptist or uh... yeah, basically, I see. basically. All right. Meanwhile, I've got another family member who is not quite as once saved, always saved. I think it's because he grew up in a different denomination. And so his thing is I've clearly apostatized and now I'm, I'm screwed. You know, I'm, I'm headed straight for hell. And so he's a lot angrier towards me whenever this conversation comes up because he really feels like I'm going to hell. So everybody's in a different place. Can I ask you about your kids? Do your, uh, your kids think you're going to hell? You know, I think that if they think about it concretely, they just can't go there. They were taught to believe in hell. But um, the way my two younger ones have talked to me about it was framed in terms of whether or not I'm going to be with them in heaven. So they're not thinking as concretely about me being tortured after I die, because I think that's just too sick. I really think that's too sick for most normal people to deal with, certainly at their age. But they have come to me in tears because they thought that I wasn't going to be with them in heaven. So they still are, are thinking through that because that's what their system has taught them. As a parent, this has to totally rattle your cage. Gotcha. I mean, if it was me, right, and someone had sort of programmed that fear into my children or they've been threatening oh my god your father you're, he's you're, he's going to hell or at least you'll be separated there's a consequence and got them all freaked out i would just be pissed off what was your take on it i was extremely upset but of course in the moment i had to to sit down and talk with them and comfort them which was a really awkward position to be in and what i decided to do is you know these were 7 and 11 year old children i was doing my best to work with what they already knew and what they already believed so i sat down with each of them and and i tried to appeal to what they've they've already come to believe i asked them first of all you you realize that people can be wrong right and they both said yes and people can be wrong about a lot of things even something like what gets people into heaven and what doesn't i didn't try to challenge the entire concept of heaven and hell cuz that's just too much to try to do in one conversation. So instead, I just said, people can be wrong about what gets you there and what doesn't, right? And they nodded. And then I said, so if God is a father, think about me and the way I treat you. If there's anything that I could do to prevent you from being harmed, wouldn't I do that? Even if you were the one trying to harm yourself? And they both nodded, yes. And I said, well, then if you can't trust me because I'm a person and I can make mistakes, then maybe you can at least trust God that God will not be mean to me like that because a good father would never let that happen to his child. And did they respond to that at all? They did. I could see a, a visible relaxation come over both of them because it was talking in a language that they understood. And I had to make kind of a split second decision. But instead of trying to challenge the entire thing at the foundation, which I felt like would be a losing battle, I decided to try to work within what they already thought. And I think it worked. I think it diffused the stress for them and they relaxed and they were able to get to sleep. Before I let you go, Neil, do you think that hell is sort of the go-to for anybody who's standing on a weak argument? I think the persistence of the notion of hell proves that faith is more of an emotional thing than an intellectual thing because it works at a different level 
than reasoning. And when you try to reason people out of hell or out of their theology, what you'll find is you're bumping up against something that's not rational. And that's why. It's because this is primarily an emotional thing. And hell is a great example of, of why that's the case. And it's the last thing that people work their way out of, for many people, when they work their way out of their faith, the fear of hell stays with them all the way to the very end. And for many people, it's the last thing to go. Do you have any advice for anybody who is sort of being pawed at by a family member, a friend, an associate, a loved one, someone who is well-meaning, but it's, it's terrified they're going to hell? Do you have any perspective that might help them sort of cope with the situation? Well, there are a lot of different ways you can approach this. I think for me, um, the most effective thing is just to appeal to their emotions. I think that their gut tells them that there's something about this that doesn't sit right with them. You're not going to be able to question the entire concept of hell and, and their whole theology in a conversation or two. I think that's just too much. I think you have to take it one step at a time. Introduce a little bit of critical thinking into the process. Ask them some questions that they can just chew on that maybe will make them think critically about this thing that they believe. And maybe even encourage them to talk to other Christians who don't hold to the same view because it, you don't have to talk to an atheist to find people who don't believe in hell. You could talk to other Christians who don't believe in it and ask them why they think differently about it, and it could influence them in that direction. I think that's one way you could, you could compromise. Neil Carter, and I'll link to the Godless and Dixie blog in the description box of this show. You've also become involved, I know, with the Clergy Project and also recovering from religion. Is that correct? That's right. And um, one of the things I'm being trained to do is uh, to work on the Hotline Project that hopefully will get covered at some point. The 184, I doubt it. And uh, it's, it's a great resource for people who call in and have questions like these. I'm going to talk to uh, Sarah Moorhead from Recovering from Religion here a little later on in the broadcast. So it would be great to hear from her. Neil, thanks so much for sharing part of your story, for your time and perspective. It's always a pleasure to kind of hang out here. And I'm sure I'll see you on the convention circuit out there, okay? Yes, you will. Thanks. Take care, bro. You too. All of these threats of hell, all of these references to hell, but what, what is hell? What is this place that we're supposed to avoid at all costs? And it's not just different from religion to religion, but you know, within Christianity, you get the apologists, the experts, the pastors all in a, a locked room and have them debate hell. It's comical. You know, it's unbelievable that a house undivided would be so divided on such a critical issue. You know, it's interesting that uh, early Judaism has no references to hell. You know, to Hades, to the lake of fire and damnation. Christianity takes most of its teachings about hell from the New Testament. And the Old Testament itself references only stuff like Sheol, which is a place of the dead. Sheol was the grave. It's the end. It's death. It's not a fiery torment. Fundamental Christianity often draws from the book of Matthew. Chapter 25, verse 41, we heard this quite a bit from the fire and brimstone preachers. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I remember an old Keith Green song from the 80s that was about the sheep and the goats. You know, he takes the sheep and he takes the goats and he separates them and the sheep get uh, heaven and the goats get slaughtered, I guess is kind of the analogy. A lot of the more moderate churches are walking away or at least partially distancing themselves from hell sermons because they want to attract people. They want to make people feel good. And how do you make people feel good if you're talking about roasting forever in the pit of darkness? And so they talk about, uh, you know, a sad place that's apart from Jesus. And you know, they speak in these terms. It's or an absolute death. It's separation from God. You either are annihilated at the end of your physical life. And that's what like the Seventh Day Adventists and the Jehovah's Witnesses and many others believe. It's just the end. Right. You don't get to go to heaven, but you don't get punished. It's just over. And other people talk about this place of darkness and sadness and separation. Of course, there's no real substantiation for for these claims, it's just some shit they made up because it sounds better than you will burn forever and ever and ever. The Roman Catholic Church defines hell as, quote, a state of definitive self-exclusion from communion with God and the blessed, which actually doesn't really sound all that bad. <laughs> Exclusion? I'll take some of that. Some peace and quiet. Islam talks about a place called Jahannam, 
which translates into hellfire, place of fire, boiling water, and various torments taking place. At the end of your physical life, the angel of death descends upon you. You get a visit from the angel of death, and you are called out to experience Allah's anger and punishment in Jahannam. Regarding the story of the well to hell, and this is something that has been floating around, I think, since the late 1980s, the story kind of goes like this. A team of Russian engineers was working in Siberia, and they had drilled this hole nine miles deep below the surface of the earth, and they broke into a cavity. They actually found this deep cavity at nine miles, and they were intrigued by what might be in it. And so they lowered an extremely heat-tolerant microphone into the well, along with some other sensory equipment that measured temperature and whatnot. And they measured the temperatures to around 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And when they listened to the audio recording from this deep hole they heard something that frightened them to their core. And the quote-unquote audio of that recording has been floating around for probably almost two decades. Are you curious? I brought about a 15 to 20 second segment to play for you right here. Now, I left this segment long in case you'd like to kind of crank it up and listen to the nuances in the recording. Because if you really listen to it, you will begin to hear the individual elements, the individual sounds, the individual screams inside the well to hell. Here it is. That's the kind of thing you might hear on the Ghost Stories broadcast. And I'll tell you, when I was a believer, if they had played something like that for me and I was a young kid or something, I'd have been totally terrified. Oh my God, they found hell and there are people screaming and it's awful. And I would have rushed to the front of the church service and I would have accepted Jesus Christ as quickly as possible. This is the tragedy of hell sermons is quite often they are sort of thrown at the young and the vulnerable so that they will do that very thing. You'll find doomsayers in the church and across the internet talking about this particular story, the well to hell. It's actually preached from some pulpits. I guess it gained fame on the Trinity Broadcasting Network. It was on TBN, and of course it's fake. I believe the true story was that the uh, Soviet Union had dug a hole about 12 kilometers deep. It wasn't Siberia. It was uh, near Norway and Finland on the Kola Peninsula, They found nothing supernatural. They found no supernatural phenomenon whatsoever. And they certainly didn't hit 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. They stopped at about 356 degrees Fahrenheit because drilling any deeper would have been just too expensive. And so they stopped at 356. They didn't hear any screams. They didn't hear a cauldron of torment and writhing and pain and all that stuff. Nothing. And it's most likely that those sound effects are loops from a film called Barren Blood, which was a film from 1972. And I guess some people have studied the audio and they think it's just a loop of different sound effects. But it looks like they grabbed something from this movie, Barren Blood, and passed it off as the literal well to hell. And that story will probably continue to be passed around throughout the coming years and decades. So many people rushing to find salvation because they are convinced that they will end up here. All right, let's go to the switchboard and talk to area code 909. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hello? All right. Are you hand gliding or something? You sound like you're uh, pulling a microphone out of your pocket or something. Now I can hear you. Tell me Wait, okay. I'll go by May. Hi, May. Sorry, I'm walking the dog. (laughs) Hang on. I'm going to slow you down just a little bit. I'm glad you're What's your dog's name, by the way? Her name is Sasha. (laughs) Well, I'm glad you and Sasha called the show. All right. Um, Okay. Did you have a perspective on the subject of hell? Did you have experience with this you wanted to share with the audience? Hit me. Yes. um, I was born Catholic. Well, not born. I was raised Catholic. 
but I never really bought into it. I was, you know, I've, I haven't been outed yet, but I was pretty, I was agnostic for a very, 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 very long time. But for me, hell seems like just a way to kind of give the finger to the out group. So if you have a person who thinks differently than you, they'll be like, oh, you're going to hell. And it's kind of the way of saying like, if you for not believing in what I believe. But there's a very interesting case. I live in California and about a year or two ago, there was this preacher whose son actually committed suicide, which is really sad. But the preacher went up, you know, being the man of the cloth and whatnot. He actually said, oh, um, you know, I feel that my son went through horrible tribulations during his life and now he's in heaven which I find to be very odd because most of the time the Christian faith says, oh, you know, you commit suicide, you go to hell. So I think that the concept of hell nowadays isn't so much a concept that a good majority of Christians believe in, but a concept which Christians use against other people. And it's not just Christians. I mean, anyone in a Judeo-Christian, well, Muslims as well also say that you're going to hell if you don't believe what they believe and so on and so forth. So in your words, it's just a big F you. It's a middle finger. It's, you know what, I'm done talking to you. And when you're all laughing, you're burning and I'm out. Is that what you're saying it is? Well, it's kind of, yeah, and it's my perspective. I mean, one time about a year ago when I was dabbling, like I was making a transition from agnosticism to atheism, my mom basically said, are you turning into an atheist? And she doesn't know that. Um, but she basically said, oh, you know, atheism is bad all the people anyone who doesn't believe in what i believe she didn't say like she didn't say anyone who doesn't believe in any kind of god but she said anyone who's not like catholic will go to hell because they're evil on the inside and it was kind of the way i hear it around here is that like i've run into people who um uh, my aunt actually went to a church where the pastor got went to jail for you know molesting children and she didn't there was no speak of hell you know there's only speak of hell when you don't believe in what they believe so there's always redemption for those who are part of your in group but there's never redemption for those who are part of your out group all right may well for the record i don't think you're evil on the inside all right i think you're you're all right and i'm glad you called the broadcast tonight and you and sasha have a great walk tonight out there on the west coast all right Yep, I'm going to download this podcast and listen to myself all day. <laughs> <laughs> all right, take care. I hope my parents will listen to it. <laughs> Bye. All right, thank you. Take care. I am an animal lover, so I've got this mental picture of what Sasha, I don't even know what kind of dog Sasha is. Claire said, my family's very Catholic, but Catholics who are very well educated about the theology of our church. Interestingly, I think my family believes my atheism is merely me going through, quote, a dark night of the soul. It sounds perverse, but among conservative Catholics who are very well educated about their faith, it's almost a badge of honor to go through a period of doubt. It proves you're really serious about your Catholicism. I'm pretty sure my sisters believe that I'll come back to God stronger than ever and perhaps even pursue a vocation as a nun. They're not worried about hell for me because they know God will get me in the end especially since I used to be so devout. I made thousands of rosaries to give away to the poor, for instance. They're completely wrong, of course, but I think these beliefs keep them from fretting about the destination. Area code 714, you're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? My name's Steve. Hi, Steve. Thanks for calling the broadcast. What do you have for us tonight? Well, the topic that you've got uh, really hit me home because um, I've got several family members who have told me that they flat out have this certainty that I will be spending the rest of eternity once I die here on this earth uh, burning my best friend, my sister, and my wife, uh, who, with whom I'm going through a divorce right now, um, have this stated belief that for many months or years, I just couldn't accept that they actually believed it. And so I would challenge them. Do you really think that because I can't accept the beliefs that your particular churches, and they're all in different ones, because I can't accept those doctrines, that I'm going to be sentenced to a never-ending fiery torment? And each one of them have said yes. 
essentially. In particular, my best friend, who I is a smart guy in every respect, and a Catholic. I challenged him. I said, do you really, really, really mean what you're saying? Because if you do, then the very limited acts that you're taking to help protect me from this belief that you have shows me that, as far as I can tell, that either you don't actually believe that I'm going to burn in hell, or you really don't care. And so I'm offering you, and I've made this offer to the others in my life as well, I'm offering you, it's, if I'm making a mistake, I don't think I am, but if I'm making a mistake, show me. I'll sit down with you, and any pastor, any priest, any apologist, any elder or group that you want, and we'll look at the Bible, and we'll talk about it seriously. But every time I raise that as an issue, the conversation goes sideways. They refuse to address things from a truth-seeking perspective. And the response that I get is essentially, I love you, but yes, you're going to burn in hell forever, and I'm going to light this 25-cent votive candle or say a prayer the next time I go to church, or when I get to heaven, I'll do whatever I can to bring you up there. It just boggles my mind that this is part of their thought process, and from my perspective, it can't end soon enough. Do they all believe in a literal hell? They say that they do. My sister's an apostolic, speaks in tongues, was shocked when she apparently discovered that I accepted evolution as true, because she does not. But yes, yeah, she believes in an actual, fiery, burning hell. Or she says she does. Does it, does it occur to her, though, that she adores the very being that is going to torture you? Like, she loves your tormentor. Does that occur to her at all? I brought it up to her, and... and her response is, Steve, I love you. <laughs> and that's about it. Have you heard the uh, variation that God doesn't really want you to go there? You choose hell. Or God has no choice because he's just. He must purify the evil. I mean, do they go there with you? Notwithstanding the fact that that's, I think you and I would agree, is an exceptionally weak argument. I don't think they've even thought about it that deeply. As far as I can tell, the people that I love that are in my life now have this belief that they're going to be in a better place when they die. They'll be able to see the people that they love when they die. We had a grandmother who just recently died, and uh, the eulogies revolved around the concept that grandmother's dancing with Jesus now. And because they have this strong urge to see their loved ones in heaven, this concept of hell sort of gets bootstrapped in, and they have to accept it, or if they don't, they have to accept that there are errors in the theology, and I just don't think they can bring themselves to do it. The cognitive dissonance is just too great. Steve, it sounds like you're outside as well. Are you are you walking, Sasha? Or <laughs> uh, no, I was out of my deck. I'll I'll, I'll go inside. No, Sorry no, about no. That. You sound fine. Your call's great. I'm glad you shared your perspective. What real real fast? What has been your approach? Do you just disconnect because it's just pain and grief and division, and they're pawing at you, or are you continuing to try to have a relationship with your family? Well, well, I do have a relationship with all of them still, but I don't disconnect. I've really tried from every perspective to engage them in a, a legitimate, loving, kind, gentle, truth-seeking conversation about whether it's actually true. Yeah, but they're not listening. I mean, so if they've made an emotional decision and there's tension in the room, you're the infidel, right? You're the prodigal. You're the broken one. And they're praying for you. Has that poisoned the relationship or you guys can live around it? Well, I, I, my sister, she and I live around it. She just doesn't address things anymore. My marriage really dissolved in great part as a result of this because we have three kids and the distance the division, this wedge that's been created because of the, the doctrines in this fundamentalist church that 
we were members of in the past, uh, and still I technically am, my ex and I have disagreed vehemently about how to approach this with the children. And she would prefer that I keep my crazy beliefs to myself. And when I've asked her, babe, this is, if I'm making a mistake, this is the most crucial mistake I could ever make. Let's engage about it. Let's go to the senior pastor. Let's talk with him about it. I've taken a hard look at this because this relationship is so important to me. And I found that there's no good reason to believe that any of it's true. But maybe I missed something. Please show me. And and I said, do you really believe that I'm going to burn in hell forever? Really? And her response on more than one occasion was, yeah, I believe you're going to burn in hell forever. And I hope you're happy about it. And it's really I it's hope just you're heartbreaking. happy about it. <laughs> oh, because because I had done this research and I had come to this conclusion that was different from hers. And she in that moment and I checked with her on other occasions and she said the same thing. She hoped that I was happy about the decision that I made based on the research that I've done. And she realized or she was certain that I was going to be burning forever. Wow. It's it's a, a I mean I don't have to tell you I know but it's it's just a horrendous belief that is negatively affecting real people children that I see and I can't wait for this to be part of our history rather than part of our current existence as humans. Well I'm sorry that you've had to pay such a heavy price for doing what so many people do, right? We didn't set out to become atheist. We didn't wake up one day and say, today I'm going to reject everything I once held dear. We just started asking questions, and we weren't satisfied with just because or have faith. So for you, I wish you a truthful life. I, I certainly hope that uh, some good does come out of this, and I uh, appreciate you sharing your story with the radio audience tonight. Much appreciated, Steve. Thank you, Seth. All right, take care. You too. Jason said, I was raised in a devout Catholic household. We're heavy Catholic tonight, aren't we? Catholic household with my seven brothers. Yeah, eight boys. And fulfilled the checklist for a young Catholic. Baptism, confession, communion, confirmation, the whole circus. I was even an altar server for almost ten years. As a young adult, I co-founded the youth group at our local church and attended weekly meeting, organized retreats and field trips, mentored teens, and gave talks to our youth group and about a half a dozen others in the surrounding area. This was no big deal for my family, just par for the course. Now that you have the idea what was expected of me, you can imagine my mother's shock when she found out I was an atheist. That first phone conversation was one I'll never forget disbelief, outrage, anger. She ran through the whole gamut of negative emotions before finally resulting to threats of damnation because telling a person who doesn't believe in magic that his soul is going to suffer will somehow straighten him out. After that phone call, I thought it was over, that we could put it behind us and pretend everything was normal. Our long conversations were suddenly a thing of the past. I'm not sure when she decided I was completely lost, but once she had, she all but stopped communicating with me. Our conversations are polite, but short. A quick exchange of information, and then she finds something more important to do. Whenever I visit, I'll find some book on Catholic apologetics in my bag. How to regain your lost faith or finding Jesus when you think he's abandoned you. Crap like that. They're the only books I've ever tossed in the garbage. She spread the word, of course, warning all my relatives about the atheist in the family. About six or eight people dropped from my friends list on Facebook in one week, all family members. I was forbidden to speak with my two youngest brothers for a time. I guess it was so I couldn't corrupt them and drag them down to the fiery depths with me. They didn't understand what was going on at the time, just that something was wrong and I was at fault. My white supremacist brother, who's been in and out of jail and prison for the past 10 years, is welcome at the house any time. I have to get a hotel when I visit for Christmas. Hell, they even accept my gay brother, sort of, though I was asked if I had something to do with turning him gay. 
I suppose we atheists get magical powers when we stop believing. They frequently remind me I could die at any moment, and if I don't have Jesus in my heart, I won't make it to heaven. They're concerned about my soul, but don't seem to care much about my life. Jason, thank you very much for the message. Area code 256. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? This is Chelsea. Hi, Chelsea. Thanks for waiting. Thanks for calling. We're talking about families who think we're going to hell. What do you have for us tonight? Oh, I have a whole slew of stories, but I'll stick to the short and sweet. Um, I grew up in the Church of Christ in Alabama, um, and that says a lot in and of itself. Um, But I'm constantly told by my mother, my sister died when she was uh, 17. And that calls my mother and my father to obviously, you know, cling to their faith even harder. And I met my now husband, and we sort of, you know, he he was never a believer, and I started questioning with him. He never pressured me. He never, you know, told me this is what you have to believe. But I was always some kind of seed of doubt within my mind, and they just kind of gave me the reassurance that it's okay to question. So I ended up being a non-believer um, after years of research and finally came out to my mother about two years ago. And she constantly is telling me, don't you want to go to heaven? You're not going to see your sister. You're not going to see me. You're going to burn for eternity. And then it gets to this angry point where she tells me that I'm as bad as Hitler because I'm an atheist. And that my husband has brainwashed me. We're both going to go to hell, and she doesn't even want to see her grandbabies because, you know, why bother? I mean, she does see her grandbabies, but she gets to this point where she's like, well, I shouldn't even see them because I don't want to get attached because they're going to go to hell with you because you're teaching them the way you are. I don't want to get too attached to my grandchildren because they'll be burning in hell while I'm in heaven, and I won't really get to hang with them anyway. This is dysfunction. This is like weapons-grade dysfunction. It hurts my heart to hear about it. I'm surprised she hasn't gone after the kids, right? My grandchildren are going to be in heaven even if, right? Has she done that? Has she tried to sneak them into church or has she given them Bible books? She'll take them to Bible school and I often, I'll let her because my whole family, I grew up in a very small church. Half the church I'm related to. Uh, My uncle is the preacher at that church. And they believe that Church of Christ is the one and only way to get to heaven. No other church on the face of the planet. Church of Christ came before Catholicism to them. Um, And I find that, yeah, the Peter's Sermon on the Mount was, that was to the Church of Christ. Because there's a scripture that says the Church of Christ salutes you. So they, of course, believe that that was talking to them. Well, it's kind of an um, but, exclusive <laughs> club if only the Church of Christ folks are going to heaven. I mean, that's a, that's that a lot very. of people being turned away at the door, don't you think? <laughs> oh, yeah. Straight and narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. That, that's their their motto, their creed. And, and I love my family very much, but my mother is just the epitome of the guilt trip, and she uses my sister against me at every turn. And I love her, and I understand that she, as a mother, she taught me this stuff. She wants me to go to heaven because she so ardently believes in it. But it's just gotten insane to where I'm I'm worse. If Hitler was baptized in the Church of Christ, he would go to heaven before I would. That's Even crazy. All, I it's mean, it, crazy. It's, it is insane. It is absolutely well, insane. And Well... I mean, are they, let me, I'm not going to dip too deeply into the, your personal life here, but are they constantly injecting negativity? I mean, are they always throwing the, you're broken, you're going to hell, you're screwed up kind of thing at you? Because that's a problem if they are. Oh, most definitely. I mean, she, anytime we go out together, and which is rare because I've kind of distanced myself and she wonders why, um, <laughs> as if that's a question, but Anytime we go out, I tell her, Mom, we can't go out together because you constantly are coming at me. You have to talk about religion. We have nothing else to talk about. And it's because she's constantly, well, you know, I must have done something wrong. I was a bad mother. Basically, you're sick. You're just so sick because you can't believe in God. And you 
why should I have any faith if, if my child's not going to be in heaven? I'm like, well, if your faith is hinged on me believing, you must not have that strong of faith. Well, and there's some emotional blackmail happening there too, right? It's a play to your sympathy and compassion for your mother. Now your mother feels like she did it wrong. She's Now she's filled with remorse and self-loathing. Then her daughter will have pity on her and then come validate her. I mean, this is a tactic. My point was this. Obviously, I never want to see families separate. But just remember to protect yourself, all right? I mean, they don't have permission to continue to beat you over the head day and night and afford themselves sort of the rules, right? They can violate boundaries anytime they want and um, inject constant toxicity into your life. They just don't have permission to do that. And so I can totally see why you might pull back just a hair, you know, do what you can with them, but don't forget to protect you in the process, all right? I'm doing the best I can. It's a daily job. Uh, aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate aren't we all? Let me be on. Well, you did great, and I'm glad to see a free thinker in the South, and you just keep on keeping on, all right? There's more than you think of us down here. The sleeping giant is down there in the South, is waiting to roar one of these days. Take care yeah, of yourself. Bring Thanks the whole, so much. The Holy for Trinity. <laughs> uh, we'll bring, you know what, I, we're going to have to do some more events in the South. I'm going to Florida here at the end of the year, but it'd be nice to do something and maybe go down to Atlanta or maybe do That'd something in awesome. Huntsville or something. So we'll, you know, we'll, let me take a look at it and we'll see what we can come up with. All right. All right. Awesome. Thanks. Sir. Uh, all right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. I just got flashes when she was talking. You know, when I first said the word atheist, it was just a barrage. It was condescension and it was hell and it was tears and I failed as a parent, which is really, it's, it's just unfair. You know, if only I had done a better job. If only I hadn't failed you, you would believe in magic, right? So they're playing on your emotions on a whole bunch of different levels. Then they turn around and say, it's your fault, right? I failed as a parent, but you left the fold. You screwed up. You misunderstand. You've been deceived. My mother loves to go after Dawkins. And I'm, you know, I admire what Richard Dawkins is and what he has done. His uh, book, The God Delusion, was instrumental in a key time in my life. I don't worship Dawkins. He's just a dude. He's just a guy. He's a flawed person like the rest of us who's done some important work that needs to be talked about and acknowledged. But the rejection of religion is more than any one person. It's really more about a quest for what is true, what is the evidence support. And that is hard for religious people to get their head around. They have to frame everything in terms of, you are going to a church and following a leader. You've traded one pastor for another. You've traded one God for another. You don't believe in Jesus, you worship Charles Darwin. This is the context in which they must frame the conversation. And it's just wrong-headed. Like, I don't worship anybody. I just want to live a truthful life, and I'm tired of being pawed at and told that I'm the problem because I demand proof before purchase. And I mean what I said about protecting yourself. Just because you're related doesn't mean you have permission to say anything you want to say and to be as hurtful as you want to be, even if you do it, quote unquote, in love. And, uh, you know, I have the right to set the tempo in my own home. If you cannot respect boundaries and if you cannot respect my right as an individual to live my life and carve my own path, it is not my problem. And I will exclude you from my circle until you can abide by the rules. And I've had to draw that line in my own life. And many people know what I'm talking about. It's tragic. But unfortunately, it does happen. Area code 402. You're on the Thinking Atheist radio podcast. Who's this? Hey, Seth. This is Jim. Um, so I guess I'm just going to talk about two things real quick, if that's all right. Go ahead. First off, kind of along the lines of what you were just saying, isn't uh, preaching a little bit counterproductive, especially towards somebody who's skeptical? Preaching to a skeptic? Well, to the religious, it's truth. To many of the religious, it's truth. It's not well, preaching, it's teaching. Is, uh, more along the lines of somebody who hasn't been introduced to religion yet. But uh, like, if they're skeptical and you start preaching to them, doesn't that sort of, under the assumption that there is hell, doesn't that sort of guarantee them a slot in hell? 
Oh, I see. If someone is not aware of hell, you're talking about the scriptures where they, uh, it's not scripture, is it? I don't think it's based in, in a verse in the Bible. And if I'm wrong, please correct me in the comment section. But there's a doctrine that if you have not yet heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and you have not been made aware then you are not on the hook when you die and you don't have to go to hell. So the argument is, why would you ever find me and preach to me about Jesus and the Bible and hell? Because now you've guaranteed if I don't accept Jesus, I'm going to hell before I had the golden ticket. Is that what you're trying to say? Right. Correct. That's well, I don't like think an I... argument I've, I've thought of, but I've, I've never heard anybody else say it before. Well, when I was a believer, the burden was upon us. Go ye into all the world. You know, don't let any stone be unturned. We find all the lost. We find all the needy, all those who require Jesus. And we felt like we were doing a good service. It didn't occur to us that by keeping the information from them, we might be protecting them. We didn't speak in those types of terms. That would, that would be a foreign language to us. We felt like we were doing something that was absolutely loving and necessary. And we felt compelled to do it every single day. What's your second point? Um, so I was hoping I could get some quick advice. I'm a college student. I recently have determined that I'm an atheist. Um, I've told my brother and sister, but I haven't told my parents yet. And uh, they're Roman Catholic, and I'm a little bit hesitant. I'm not sure what to expect when I do come out, and I plan on coming out uh, the next month to them. Were you uh, casual Catholics, or were you hardcore? I can count the number of times I missed church on my uh, fingers and toes. I taught Sunday school for about 10 years, um, though they, I wouldn't say that my family knows the Bible particularly well, but they were definitely um, very, I, I, I would make the argument they're very devout. Well, I can't speak to what you should or shouldn't do, except to say this, if you're not sure, don't come out. All right, you're a college student, I'm guessing they're paying for at least a significant percentage of your college tuition, is that right? I've got a full ride through college right now. Okay, well, that liberates you at least a little bit, but I have seen college students whose parents have blackmailed them and said, you don't mention this atheism nonsense anymore, or we will pull all of your college funding, which essentially is saying, we will financially blackmail you, we may alter the trajectory of the rest of your life, we may limit your opportunities just because we have a disagreement on the issue of God. But I think if you're not sure at any point if you don't fully have your feet on the ground, if you're not in a place where you can be sort of self-sustaining and have that boundary around you, I would hang back. We're playing a longer game here. Many people start to feel guilty if they don't come out. I'm being duplicitous. I'm a coward. And just like the recent openly secular campaign said, it's important for all of us to come out when and wherever we can. But if you're not sure... Play a slower game. Hang back. The time will come, and you do it on your own terms. Fair enough? Yeah, that sounds good. Thank you, Seth. I appreciate it. All right. Best wishes in your studies, and thanks for calling the broadcast, my friend. Thank you, Seth. Have a good one. All right. Take it easy. Yeah, I talk to a lot of people, and they're like, I, I really feel like I should. I want to say something. I, I know. I, I, feel, I feel like I'm, I'm just weak. <laughs> and sometimes many of those people face significant consequences. You know, they live in a place, they exist in an environment, they are part of a family where the shit really will hit the fan and they are not prepared for the consequences. It could really screw up their lives. In that case, yeah, I think slow down, play a longer game. If you're not sure, wait until you are sure. And that's about the best I can do on that subject. Sarah Moorhead is a, a dear friend of mine. You probably heard her speak in conventions all around the country, and uh, she's heavily involved with recovering from religion. And I really wanted her perspective on the broadcast tonight because I know she's got some experience here. Sarah, thanks so much for being here tonight. Great to have you. Hey, thanks for having me. Just for the record, tell everybody what your role is with recovering from religion. What's the organization about, and, and what do you do for them? Sure. So I'm the executive director, and um, what we do is provide practical resources for people who are reconsidering the role of religion in their life or otherwise negatively affected by faith. Well, let's talk about negatively affected, which speaks to the theme of the show, right? The theme of tonight is my family thinks I'm going to hell, and we're hearing from all these people who are being pawed at by religious loved ones who are operating in love by saying some pretty awful things about hell. This is something you've encountered quite a bit, right? 
Absolutely. We, we get that a lot. We hear from a lot of people who are in very similar situations. Do you have some personal experience with anything like that, Sarah? I do. Um, in fact, my mother-in-law died um, a couple of years ago, and at her funeral, the minister decided that was the appropriate opportunity to um, preach against the evils of disbelief and atheism, and in front of my children and the entire congregation, um, went out of his way to make sure everyone knew that the atheist sitting in the front row would not be joining uh, my mother-in-law in heaven because we were going to hell. Kind of a passive-aggressive thing. He knew all about you and decided to make the sermon about you as well. Absolutely. Essentially turning the casket of a loved one into a soapbox for himself, which is obscene when you really stop to think about it. Yeah, we're we're there. My children are grieving. My husband's grieving. Um, We're all, of course, you know, going through this process of, of losing someone we love dearly and who loved us, and to then have to try to explain to my children why these words that are you know, they've never even really heard before, but they're, they're angry and they're scary and they're, you know, very vivid imagery and and all of those things are are being presented to them um, and directed at them and their parents. Um, It's not just confusing for everyone else, you know, who's there to grieve for someone that they've missed and lost, but it's just hurtful and it's disrespectful on so many levels. I've seen some funerals where they have altar calls. You know, don't let today pass without making it right with Jesus, that kind of thing. And and it's hugely inappropriate. I can I have this mental picture of you on the front row. Part of you wants to run out of the auditorium with your kids and the other part wants to run to the stage and just. (laughs) <laughs> just and throttle exactly the guy. What we think. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, he was going on and on um, about, you know, how God is the ultimate watchmaker and, you know, of course, making a dig at Dawkins as if somehow that made some relevance in the process of what we were going through that day. And, and what what I ended up doing, just because it would not stop, it was the, the first few minutes I was kind of going, okay, it's a tiny town. And, and this was a minister that had grown up with my husband, um, so they'd known each other their whole lives, and I thought, okay, we'll just we'll let him get a little dig in, and then and then he'll move on, and he just would not move on. So I ended up taking my kids, and and we went outside and and picked flowers for their grandma, and um, and made the best of it until the end of the service because I just I, we couldn't sit there and and let the kids be subjected to that. Did you come from a theology, a belief system, a culture that believed in hell? Oh, absolutely. I grew up evangelical Southern Baptist, so the concept of hell is far from metaphorical. In fact, I I didn't realize that there were any beliefs that held a metaphorical belief of hell or or damnation or falling away or anything like that. In our world, it was incredibly real and tangible and an absolute place that you actually go if you don't meet all the expectations that you're supposed to. When you emerged, did it kind of freak you out? Did you still have those lingering fears? I don't want to burn. I know logically that it's wrong, but emotionally I'm still kind of screwed up, right? Yeah, that's actually one of the things we're we're finding in people when they're working with us at Recovering from Religion, and it was true for me as well. The the fear of hell is one that seems to linger for a really long time, And, and my guess is because it's something that is ingrained in people from the minute, you know, the, the earliest story for children are about, you know, if you don't do what God wants, you're going to be turned out, you're going to be sent out from the Garden of Eden, you're going to be sent to hell, you know, any of those things. And, and that becomes very real and very scary, and they drill that into you. So it's no surprise that it's one of the last remaining things that people find that, you know, have to find a way to let go of. I'd like to be able to sort of point people toward recovering from religion because I know Daryl Ray and you and so many wonderful people have invested so much in this. It's not just for atheists, right? It is for Correct. people who are who are going on a journey or going through something and they need kind of a safe place. Is that an accurate way to say it, Sarah? Completely accurate. We, we work with people who are questioning, you know, any belief system, um, regardless of where they're at right now. We have people um, who we talk to regularly who are in our support network 
who consider themselves Christians, who consider themselves Jewish, who consider themselves, you know, Muslim all across the spectrum. Um, and really what it is that they're looking for a safe place they can ask questions and be provided resources where they can explore further, you know, and, and there's, we, we don't just, you know, kick back to there's one book that answers all the questions. You know, we, we like to encourage people to find as many books as possible and, and articles and talk to other people who have been through similar circumstances and, and all those things and really get as broad a perspective as possible so that, you know, in, in the end they're coming to their own conclusions, but in a way that tapping into such a wealth of information that they didn't know existed before. The website is recoveringfromreligion.org. By the way, Sarah, I must say again, congratulations on being the 2013 American Atheist Atheist of the Year. Dun, dun, Thank dun. you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I hey, Sarah and I are friends, so every time I see her, it's like, oh my God, it's the Atheist of the Year. Uh, <laughs> it, it, you, No one knows, no one realizes how hard you work and on how many projects you are working on simultaneously if people did i think they might bow down and worship you Sarah. <laughs> i do like to stay busy i think that's that's yeah I, it's just one of those things I, I enjoy staying as busy as possible i can't imagine that all right well all my best now can I mention that you're working on a special project for 2016, or is that still under wraps at this point? Oh, measure? no, absolutely. Go ahead. The Reason Rally was sort of a defining moment among free thinkers back in 2012. And in 2016, it is happening again. And Sarah Moorhead is part of the sort of the machine that's putting all of that together. Anything you can share with us yet, or is it all still sort of coming together? It's all still coming together. We, we're expecting to have a date um, in the next couple months. So, you know, that should be coming soon, and we'll certainly get that out as soon as we have it. Um, I have a fantastic team. I've got Jamila is my vice president, Jamila Bay. Teresa McBain is my communication chair. Liz Liddell is my secretary, and Shannon Nebo from Be Secular is my treasurer. So we have a wonderful powerhouse of women who are, are you know, we're all coming together and using all our ideas and, and it's going to be amazing. I mean, it's the, you know, the, the first one laid a fantastic groundwork and had a great turnout. And now we have this, this great foundation that we can build on and I'm very excited to see everybody in DC. Um, now it will be on the national mall again. Is that right? Same location, same place. It'll, it will be in Washington, D.C. Um, it's kind of dicey as to, you know, exactly what spot you end up in when you go to the national parks. But it will be yeah. in D.C. It will be at a national park. Um, probably along the mall is, is very, very likely. But, of course, we don't have the exact spot just yet. Well, I know they don't make it easy to actually reserve that. They have all these rules and guidelines and everybody's sort of waiting in a long queue to sort of grab those spaces. We'll keep an eye on it. Be looking for more details coming probably mid-summer of this year for the Reason Rally in the spring of 2016. Sarah Moorhead, thanks so much for spending a few minutes on the radio, and I will see you soon, okay? Thanks so much, Seth. I appreciate it. I wanted to finish the broadcast with something that was written by Neil Carter, who we spoke to at the beginning of the show. He had put a blog up that just posted yesterday called, You're Not Going to Miss Me When I'm Gone? Question mark. And I thought it was a great way to cap the discussion that we've been having today. And with his permission, I'm going to read it to you here. I've also linked it in the description box of this broadcast in case you'd like to go back and perhaps send it to someone you know. It reads like this, Dear Family Member, I know it upsets you that my beliefs have changed. I no longer identify with the faith in which you raised me, and perhaps this brings you shame, because you're inclined to assume personal responsibility for the direction my life takes. Maybe it even feels to you like a personal betrayal. It's not, by the way, because this isn't really about you, is it? It's about me. You may also fear for my soul, and it makes you unspeakably sad to think that after we die, you will go to heaven, and I will not be there with you. I no longer believe the same things you do about that either, and for that shortcoming you might even believe I will be brought back from the dead just to be punished, perhaps even perpetually. That doesn't really make sense to me, but let's leave that aside for the moment and instead talk about how sad this makes you. I want to ask you a question about that, and I hope you'll take some time to really think about the implications of what I'm asking. Do you believe that you will miss me 
in heaven. If you're going there and I am not, do you expect my absence to cause you sadness then and there in that place? It seems to me there are two options. If you miss me in heaven, and if this causes you pain and sadness there, then heaven isn't really what you were promised it would be, is it? You can't exactly have every tear wiped away if you're sobbing for my absence the way you sometimes do now. But what's the alternative? That you won't miss me in heaven? Will you get there and forget that I ever existed? Will you remember me but feel no pain for my absence? Am I such a passing element of your life that you'll spend eternity not missing me at all? Can you truly be happy in heaven without the ones you love being there? Suppose for a moment that you'll be just fine. Suppose that you won't miss me, and you will experience no sadness for my absence at all because heaven is supposed to be free of sorrow and pain, right? If that's the case, then shouldn't you be letting your future state of mind affect you in the here and now? Isn't that something you were taught to do? The Bible speaks of your trials being light and momentary compared with the weight of glory that awaits you, and it suggests that you should let your future way of seeing things impact the way you see them now. It tells you to, quote, set your mind on things above and not on things below, because your current state is temporary and your future state is permanent. Does that really work? If so, then why can't the same principle apply to soothing this sadness by considering that you won't feel a thing once you're in heaven? I know you feel sadness now, but don't your beliefs teach you that you won't feel sadness in the afterlife? I wonder if you really believe that. I mean, I know you want to believe it, and you were taught to believe it, but do your instincts tell you otherwise? Doesn't it strike you as somehow wrong that someone you love will be gone, and you won't feel a thing? Perhaps you're okay with that. Perhaps you feel completely confident you won't feel any pain, in which case you have nothing to worry about. The light and momentary sadness you feel now will be more than made up for by the oblivion to my absence that will one day replace your grief. In that case, you have something to look forward to, and you should take comfort in this assurance from your faith. Unless it's not really all that comforting. Because maybe it isn't. And I don't claim absolute knowledge or omniscience, but I would like to suggest that your instincts tell you this doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any sense that all your loved ones will reunite one day in heaven and your whole family will celebrate new life together, except not me. I'll be left out, presumably because I didn't believe the right things or whatever you believe my cardinal shortcoming may be. Whatever the reason, it seems to me you have two choices. You can do what the good book says and trust that your sorrows will be brief and will soon be replaced with rejoicing, in which case, what are you worried about? Or you can follow your own heart now and conclude that what you've been told will happen to me and to you makes no emotional sense. Either way, something isn't right. It grieves me to see you suffer the way you're suffering. I want to ease your pain. And from my perspective, your suffering is totally unnecessary. It also puts something between you and me that strains our relationship unnecessarily. So please do both yourself and me a favor and reconsider whether or not your pain is based in a notion that cannot be questioned. Ask yourself the questions I've asked and see if there's any hope for looking at this differently. It would mean the world to me if you could. And that's the article from Neil Carter called You're Not Going to Miss Me When I'm Gone. And again, I will link that in the description box 
of this broadcast. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks to those who shared their stories and perspectives tonight. Next week, we're going to lighten things up, especially in light of this heavy topic this week. It's called The Weirdest Websites in the World. And if you have a nomination for a very weird website, it can be religious or otherwise, you can send those to podcast at thethinkingatheist.com. We're going to have some fun with that next Tuesday night. Huge thanks again to our sponsor, Harry's Razors. A smarter shaving experience delivered right to your door. $5 off your first purchase with our promo code. So go to harrys.com, promo code Thinking Atheist. That's H A R R Y S dot com. And I will see you next week. Take care. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com.